And so today we're going to look at the church. How does it work? The church, how does it work? Look at everything that happens here. How does it, I mean, make some sense as to how this whole thing comes together. I'm going to invite you to start off in 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. And, and, you know, drum roll please. I've only got two sermon points for you today. Mm. Somebody say amen. Don't worry, there are 16 sub points for each one. And so we'll get you out of here by about 3.30 when we have the baptism at 3, okay? So uh, today the church, uh, how does it work? Who's in charge? What are the rules? What, what's the purpose? How do we get things done? And today I just want to give you two, two ways uh, that the church gets things done. Two ways that the church works. Number one is this, write this down. The church works under the authority of Scripture. We work under the authority of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. It says this, all Scripture, somebody say all Scripture, all scripture. is inspired by God. Some translations say God breathed. It is literally breathed out by the Lord. It is inspired by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. All scripture is God breathed. So here's what we need to know. It's God's church. Ephesians chapter five says that Christ is the head of the church. Uh, it, it says, you know, uh, wives be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the savior of the body. And then it goes on to say, but husbands, what? Love your wives as Christ love the church. So he's the head. So it's God's church. Christ is the head. And, and, and this is important. He created the owner's manual for his church. He created the owner's manual. The word of God, scripture, the Bible, whatever you want to call it, it is the blueprint for God's house and God's people. Unfortunately, there are many that are pulling away from the blueprint. It, it truly is the blueprint for your life and for my life. There are people everywhere today that think that, and even today, that think I'm the boss here. Well, hey, boss man, how's it going at the church? Hey, how's your church? Hey, don't you run that church? My, my daughter uh, had a little uh, issue with someone online due to a service that she provided, and somebody went on a word of mouth page and was saying something kind of negative about her, and, uh, you know, no big deal. I mean, she's, she's a grown-up now, you know, that's, that's the world that we live in. Well, somebody came to her aid and was like, hey, you know, I think she does a really good job, and, and they were trying to defend her, which probably made her feel good, and then somebody else chimes in and says, hey, you better be careful what you say. I hear her dad is the owner of that mega church in Umatilla. So, so, so let me provide some clarity here real quick. Um, I'm not the owner of the mega church in Umatilla. And even if I was, I, I'm, I'm not standing around with an AR-15 going out to defend my daughter here, okay? But people look at pastors and leaders in the church and they say, hey, they're in charge. Can I tell you something real quick? I know who's in charge and, and he's not standing on the stage right now. He's in charge. This, this is his church. And here's what I want you to know. He wrote the blueprint. He laid it out. And he said, all scripture, not just portions, not just this section or that section, all scripture. And it says this, it's profitable. All scripture is profitable. Don't you love that, profitable? Don't we all want to be profitable? When I say the word profitable, what do you think of? You got, a, you got your own business. Nobody wants their business to fail. We want to make money. People say, you know what, Pastor? You know, I, I hear that ministers, they shouldn't be worried about money. Let me tell you something. I got seven kids, okay? I like money. Now, now the Bible says the root of all evil is the love of money. But let me tell you something. You give me a $100 bill, that, that'll take 50% off maybe my grocery trip if I don't get half of the items that I'm going to get. I mean, hey, I'm, I'm telling you, money, money, it's, it, it makes us profitable in things. But here's what I want you to know. All Scripture makes you and I profitable in teaching, in reproof for correction. It adds value to our life. It, it, it builds us up. It creates, it creates an increase in our life. And the Bible tells us just about 
everything. The Bible teaches us about marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. And today, just so you know, I'm throwing out like tons of Bible verses today that, that aren't going to be up on the screen. So if you want to write them down, you can. Um, so the Bible tells us about marriage, Ephesians chapter 5. Uh, we, we shared with you about wives being subject to their husbands, about husbands, you know, submitting there and, and being, sac you know, sacrificing for their wife just as Christ loved the church. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 24, the Bible says, man shall leave his father and mother and the two shall become one that he shall cleave to his wife and the two shall become one. The Bible is very clear that, that marriage is between one man and one woman, nothing else. So just because our society has created marriage in so many different avenues and so many different ways, does it make it right? So, so is marriage between man and man? No, that's not what the blueprint says. Is marriage between woman and woman? No, that's not what the blueprint says. But you say, Pastor, our culture, our culture didn't write this handbook for our life. And so we have to fall under the authority of Scripture. The Bible tells us about parenting. Proverbs chapter 22, verse 6. Train up a child in the way they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. How many of you parents have been naming it and claiming it on that verse for a long time? Some of you are like, God, you better honor your word. Think about this. If you break that verse down, train up a child in the way. The way, the truth, the truth. The life. When we train up our, our children in Christ, we give them a foundation to stand upon in a crazy world that is full of sinking sand. The Bible tells us about forgiveness. 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sin and cleanse us from all all unrighteousness. But the Bible doesn't just tell us about us getting forgiveness. The Bible says that we should also what? Forgive the Lord's prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts or trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. So we need to be mindful that the Bible, this blueprint that, that the church falls under the authority of, it teaches us all of these things. The Bible teaches us about courage. Joshua chapter 1, ver verse 9. Be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. I got sucked in this week, man. Sucked into watching the news. Anybody else? You know, being able to literally see war on a video screen is weird. Being able to see the massacre that has taken place, the, the babies that uh, their lives were taken, uh, the stories and the testimonies, it sucks you in. And, and when it does, it easily can take you away to a place of fear and worry and I'm scared and what if, and God says be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. And, and I would say this, even as the Lord spoke that to Joshua and his people um, back as they were walking around the promised land, the same goes for us today. We should have courage. So you say, Pastor Brooks, the church, how does it work? How does, how does Scripture lead us as to what we do here at this church? I'm glad you brought that up because it really helps the end of sermon point number one. I want to share something with you from Colossians chapter 1. And if you're interested, you can look there. If you're not interested, um, you can look there. Um, Colossians chapter 1 tells us something about Christ and, and, and this church being his. I just want to read this real quick and then I'm going to continue on. Colossians 1 verse 15. It says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in heaven's and on both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. For him. I hope you realize today that you've been created and you were created through him, you were created for him. This building that we dwell in right now, it was created through him. It was created for him. My life as an individual, you, you may call me pastor, but other people call me dad. Somebody else calls me husband. But at the end of the day, I'm a child of God. 
And I've been created. I've been created by him. I've been created for him. And so that means that, that my life should be surrendered to Christ in every area. I missed a verse, I think. Let me go back. Y'all got me sidetracked. You got me all fired up. <coughs> Oh yeah, verse 17, he is before all things and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. I'm gonna tell you real quick, you write down anything that today you want, but write this one thing down. It'll change your life. When you allow Christ to become everything in your life, in your marriage, in your business, in your hobbies, as a parent, as a grandparent, as a pawpaw, as a mimi, whatever they call you. When you let Christ be your everything, it changes your life. How do we function as a church under the authority of Scripture? Well, we pray on Sunday, don't we? Y'all heard us pray before? We pray. Why do we pray? Do we pray just because we want to talk to the ceiling tiles? No, we're talking to God. Through the power of the Holy Spirit, because of Jesus Christ and what he's done, we have access to heaven. Why do we pray? Matthew chapter 21, verse 13, the Lord said, my house will be called a house of house of prayer. That's why we pray. Why do we praise the Lord on Sunday morning? And I get it. Some of you, some of you praise the Lord a little bit more than others. Some of you say, hey, ho. Oh. Some of you like raising your hands. I'm all for it. I think we should. If you yelled as much in church as you yelled as the, at the TV yesterday, we'd really be praising the Lord. Amen? <laughs> Psalm 150, praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty expanse. Praise him in his, for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with harp and lyre. Praise him with timbrel and dancing. Praise him with stringed instruments and pipe. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with resounding cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. On the count of three, we're going to take a deep breath. One, two, three. <laughs> Did I say it wrong? On the count of three, we're going to take a breath. One, two, three. Man, I'm really off today. Man, I need to look back to my notes. If the Bible says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. That means if you're alive, you are without excuse. God's still got you living, you are without excuse. Why? We are called to praise the Lord in everything. We are called to praise him. Why do we sing and worship and praise? Because the scripture tells us to. Why do we preach the word of God? Because you want to be entertained on Sunday? No, because Mark chapter 16, verse 15 says, go into the world and preach the gospel to all creation. Why do we do that? Why, why is the word of God and the, the proclamation of the word of God important? Because uh, the Bible says that faith comes by hearing and hearing by the words of Christ. That's why we do it. And today we're going to baptize people. Why do we baptize the way that we baptize? Why do they go all the way down and all the way up? Because that's the example that we have in Scripture. It, is baptism wash away sins? No. How do we know that? Because Jesus himself was baptized. It is a symbol of our faith in the Lord. It is a step of obedience. And I'm telling you right now, there are some of you in the space, even today, that you weren't thinking about it. But this afternoon at 3 o'clock, you need to get baptized, I guarantee you. Because you gave your life to the Lord, but you never took the first step of obedience, honoring the word of God in believer's baptism. And today when we get in that water... I'm going to look at somebody, a man that comes down, and I'm going to say, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, buried with Jesus in the likeness of his death. And then we wait for about 45 seconds. <laughs> and raised to walk in newness of life. Ladies, for 50 bucks, I'll hold him down for a minute. All right, here we go. <laughs> Why do we do that? Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, go there for it tells us what? To make disciples and baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. We, how, how does the church work? We, we fall under the authority of Scripture. Hey, Pastor Brooks, why do we do what we do? We do it because that's what the Word of God has laid out for us. It's the truth of God. And I'm going to tell you, I want our church to be so full of Jesus. Amen? 
I mean, when somebody drives past this campus, I want them to sense the power of the Lord. When somebody comes in this building, I don't want them to see church. I want them to know I got to stand in the presence of God. Yeah, haven't you ever heard that little joke? It says, man, I want to be so full of Jesus when I get bit by a mosquito, he flies away saying, man, there's power in the blood. <laughs> Some of you needed that today. Some of you needed that today. Can I tell you this? Not every church is that way. A lot of churches are leaving the blueprint. A lot of churches, it's about man, it's not about God. A lot of churches, uh, you don't sense the spirit of the Lord. A lot of churches, you don't see people getting baptized. A lot of churches, they don't give invitations. A lot of churches, you don't see an altar call where individuals are literally surrendering their life to the Lord. This old man uh, went to church one Sunday morning. Old cowboy entered into this building just before services were about to begin. The old man... <clears throat> And his clothes were spotless clean, but, his, but he wore blue jeans, a denim shirt, boots that were very worn and ragged. And in his hand, uh, he carried a worn-out hat and an equally worn-out Bible. The church he entered was in an upscale, exclusive part of the city. Probably Mount Dora. <laughs> Let's move on. It was one of the largest and most beautiful churches this old cowboy had ever been in. The people in the congregation were all dressed with expensive clothes and accessories. As the cowboy took a seat, the others moved away from him. No one greeted him, spoke to him, or welcomed him. They were all appalled at his appearance and didn't even, at and didn't even attempt to hide it. As the old cowboy was leaving the church, the preacher approached him and asked the cowboy, do me one favor, sir, before you come back to this church again, have a talk with God and ask him, what he thinks would be the appropriate attire for you to worship here in this church. The old cowboy assured the preacher he would do that very thing. The next Sunday, he showed back up to the services wearing the same ragged jeans, shirt, boots, and hat. Once again, he was completely shunned by the congregation and ignored. The preacher approached the man and said, I thought I asked you to speak to God uh, before you came back here to our church. And the, the cowboy said, well, I did, preacher. Uh, he said, well, if you spoke to God, what did he tell you would be the proper attire that you should wear for worshiping here at this church? And the cowboy said, well, sir, God told me he didn't have a clue what I should wear here. He's never been in this building. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. I, I, I want to be a church that's so full of Jesus that even when a car drives by on Highway 19 right now, they know God is at work in this place. That when they drive by and they see construction, they don't just see some mega church. They see the hand of God moving in a community. That when people pour out of this building and the parking lot is full of cars and people that look like Black Friday, people going to the store minus the road rage, that they see something has to be happening there that is greater than man. It's God. It's Christ. It's the Spirit of the Lord doing a work within his church. Secondly, another way that the church works, we work through the power of the Spirit. 1 Corinthians, take, take a look at 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <coughs> 1 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm going to actually read uh, quickly John chapter 14. Jesus knew that he was about to die and he told his disciples, he said, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper that he may be with you forever. And that is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him. But you know him because he abides with you and will be with you. Here's the great thing. The Lord knew that the disciples were going to be worried that he was gone. And he's like, guys, hang tight. Don't worry. I'm leaving you the helper. I'm going to leave you the helper. I mean, how many of us today need help? I mean, seriously, think about our lives and where we're going in that moment where you're like, God, I need your help. And the Lord's like, I, I've, I've left you in my spirit. Can I tell you this? November the 30th. I, I remember it like it was yesterday. November 30th, 2007, I was leaving Geneva, Alabama with a 30-foot U-Haul packed to the top. We didn't even have that many kids then. I stopped at a convenience store. I got a soda and a pack of grape bubblicious bubble gum. 
because I knew I was going to be on the road for about five and a half hours. Jamie had already come down here. We were moving to Lake County. I was coming to be the pastor of First Baptist Church of Umatilla, and I remember riding in that U-Haul all the way down the interstate. You know, Interstate 10, you got a lot of time to talk to God or talk to pine trees, whatever you want to talk to. And I said, Lord, I don't know how to lead a church. God, I don't know how to be a pastor. I need your help. Lord, I can't do this on my own. God, you, you promise you'll never leave me. You'll never forsake me. God, I'm asking you to guide me. And can I tell you something? Almost 16 years later, I'm still saying that to the Lord. <laughs> Lord, I don't know how to pastor a church. I don't know how to put up with all these crazy people. <laughs> Lord, you got to help me. you got to guide me. Can I tell you what the Spirit of the Lord does? The Spirit of the Lord comforts us. Amen. He comforts us. Y'all know that song? That those of you that grew up, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. Why, why, why do we have that comfort? Why? Because he's with us. God's presence, his spirit comforts us. He guides us. You realize the spirit of the Lord guides us. Can you imagine this? 158 years ago, there was a group of people in North Lake County that had a desire by the Lord, being guided by the spirit of God, to start a church in Umatilla. I'm sure they didn't have tons of resources I'm sure there was worry and fear, but they prayed, they put their minds together, they sought the Lord, and they started a church 158 years ago. And 158 years later, guess what? It's still standing. There's still a body of believers here that are seeking the Lord. Looking at the crowd, I don't know if any of you were here 158 years ago when we started, all right? If so, we'll give you special recognition real quick. He guides us. He convicts us. He convicts us. Can I tell you this about conviction? When the Holy Spirit of God convicts you, it shows that God loves you. Conviction is a tug at the heart trying to change us into something that God has, uh, uh, has called us to be. So I, I, got to, I got to speak on Wednesday night. Pastor Chase has gone on a sabbatical this month. I got to speak to the youth on Wednesday night. You want to find out how old you are real quick? Go speak to sixth graders and the sixth grade through twelfth grade. And I felt like it went pretty good, had a good response. A young lady actually came up after the service, and, and she had shared with me. She said, Pastor Brooks, I know I'm not living the way that I'm supposed to be living. And it, I was talking about the battle between the spirit and the flesh. The struggle is real. And, and she says, I'm feeling convicted. And, and I looked at her, and I said, that, that's God's sign that he loves you, and he's trying to pull you away from that life that you're living. First Corinthians chapter 12 tells us a little bit more about the role of the Spirit in our lives. Verse 7, 1 Corinthians 12, it says, But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit uh, for the common good. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by one Spirit, to another the effecting of miracles to another prophecy, to another distinguishing spirits, uh, to various kinds of tongues and other, and, an, and to another, the interpretation of tongues, to uh, but one and the same, the Spirit works all these things, distinguishing, excuse me, distributing to each one individually just as he wills. Now this is important. We are the body of Christ. As the people of God, as the church of God, we are the body of Christ. Some people in the body are the eyes. So the eyes could be those that cast the vision. They look ahead. They're planners. They're looking out for the overall well-being of the church. Some are the mouth. <laughs> the, the mouth would be the, the, the preachers and the teachers. Some are the hands that are serving. Wherever it, wherever it may be, serving in different areas. Some very well could be the feet. The feet of those that go out and do outreach. And our, what I was at a store the other day, not the one in Sanford, a different one. And this lady came up to me and she goes, you're the pastor at First Baptist Jim Matilla, aren't you? She said, I've always wanted to meet you. And I said, well, I'm right here. 
And she says, I just got to let you know, I, I, I have wanted to meet you to tell you how amazing your Helping Hands food pantry is. She says, my, my husband has had medical issues. We've, we've, we've been struggling financially. We've had to go to the Helping Hands food pantry for assistance. But can I tell you something real quick? We, what, what I receive when I go over there is so much more than food. The people love us. The people show God's love. They, they pray for us. And here's, here's the thing. If we were only giving out food, we're doing a, we're doing a jam up job. But God has called us to minister to more than just the stomach. He's called us to minister to the soul of a person. And this lady said, Pastor, I've always, I wanted to meet you because I want you to know those people over there, they are reaching me. It's a joy to actually show up to the food pantry. You know, it's a humbling thing to know that, that you're down and out and you need the assistance of somebody else. But man, when you're loved... You look forward to it. So some are called to be the eyes and some the mouth and the hands and the feet. The, the Holy Spirit bestows upon each believer a different spiritual gift. And, and it's key for us to understand that when that gift is, when you use your spiritual gift that God has given you, and you use yours, and you, and you, and you, when we all use the spiritual gift that God through the Spirit has bestowed upon us, the, the church is strong. The body of Christ is strong. But here's what I want you to know. This is important. When you choose to not use the spiritual gift that God has bestowed upon you, you are stealing from the body of Christ. You, you are literally stealing from the body of Christ. Some have the gift, the spiritual gift of teaching. You, you had a, maybe a Sunday school teacher growing up, um, maybe a, a preacher in your life that, that delivered the word of God. I don't know if you've ever heard the name Truett Cathy. Um, I don't think he invented the chicken sandwich, but he created a pretty good chicken restaurant called Chick-fil-A. You know, he made a commitment with his business from the get-go that they were going to be closed on Sunday. And I'm going to tell you why he did that for a couple of reasons. Number one, he wanted to go to church. Uh, number two, he wanted his people to be able to take Sunday off to worship God. He knew that God had said that you're going to work six days and the seventh day you're going to rest. And he honored the Lord in that very thing. And I can tell you today, Chick-fil-A uh, has more revenue in six days and less hours worked than most fast food chains that are open seven days and more hours. Is that just because the waffle fries are off the chain? No, it's because God blessed his obedience. And he made a commitment to that. And you want to know another reason why he made a commitment to that? He was a Sunday school teacher for over 50 years at First Baptist Church of Jonesboro, Georgia. He taught uh, a, a young boy's uh, class, Sunday school class, stayed faithful every, I mean, can you imagine, can you imagine if your Sunday school teacher owned Chick-fil-A? <laughs> you know every Sunday you were going to have biscuits, Amen. I mean, even if they had to be reheated, it's like, man, Mr. Truett, let me tell you. Some people have the gift of teaching. Some people have the gift of giving. If I was the pastor and Truett Kathy was a member of, of the church that I was at, I would hope that he had the gift of teaching and giving, just FYI. I'm just keeping it real. Some people have the gift of giving. You know, this year uh, I talked about it costs $400 to send a child or a youth to summer camp. And I asked you, I said, how many of you ever been to summer camp before? People raised their hand. And I said, you know, summer camp can change a person's life. And I'm talking about, you know, a Christ-centered summer camp, a Bible-teaching summer camp. And I said, how many of us, if we had to set our mind to it, could, could come up with 400 bucks to potentially change a person's life? And I'm going to tell you, this year, we had more people step up to the plate and pay for kids and youth to be able to go to a camp. And what you were doing when you wrote that check, when you gave that money, is you were saying, I, I want to I I surrender back to God. I want the, the money that, that the Lord has blessed me with to go and bless other people. And the Lord used it. The, God has used our church in so many ways. We built homes in the Dominican Republic. We have done ministries all around. We have helped other churches open up food pantries. We, we're, building, uh, we're building facilities in different countries, uh, building churches 
in other countries, helping uh, pastors in other countries. All of that is through the gift of giving. You, you may have the gift of serving. And you say, Pastor, I, I'm not really a talker. I don't want to be on stage. I don't really like being in front of a crowd. But, man, I, I, I'm a behind-the-scenes type of person. Let, sign me up. Give me a task. Uh, and, and get, get out of my way and I'll get it done. I mean, we have people that show up on church campus to pull weeds from time to time. Uh, they've, they've never been appointed into a committee. They just see a, a flower bed that has some weeds. And, and I want you to know today, after this uh, service, you've all been voted into the weed uh, pulling committee. Here at uh, First Baptist Church of Umatilla, all those in favor, please say aye. Oh, okay, apparently not. <clears throat> For somebody to see, this is my church. You know, this is God's campus. I want it to look good. People that pull up on campus and just like pick up trash, kill ants, you know, uh, you know, uh, the, just walking around praying. People that prayer walk around the campus asking God's will uh, to be done. When I was, uh, I left high school, I went to, <clears throat> excuse me, I went to Tallahassee um, when I went to school right after, right after high school. And my brother and I were, we were members of the college ministry at First Baptist Church of Tallahassee. And, you know, downtown Tallahassee, parking's horrible. There's so many buildings and streets, but very, very few parking areas. And so for our church, you had to park a few blocks away and, and, and you know, then walk up a hill just to get to the service. And there was a guy named, uh, his name is Mr. Tudor, T-U-D-O-R. <clears throat> and, and I tell you, that guy, he was a greeter. And he stood at the front door of that church every Sunday for the college service. And when it was raining, man, that guy would be out there with an umbrella. And he'd meet you out He'd meet you out in the street corner because you're having to come up this hill. He'd meet you out there in the street corner and he'd hold that umbrella. Hey, Brooks, good to see you today, brother. He'd hold that umbrella just like this. And while he's walking me in, uh, he's getting wet the whole time, but he's keeping me dry. I was at that church for two and a half years, and I can say this, hum I'm going to say this humbly because I'm, I'm a preacher. I loved our pastor. He helped me grow in my walk with the Lord. Uh, I, I definitely matured in my walk with Christ. But today, today, right now, I can't tell you one sermon that he ever preached. I cannot list a sermon title or sermon points that he ever delivered. But you know what I do remember? I remember a man that served God just like Jesus did. And he covered me up in the rain while he let rain fall down on his head as he served. He showed me Jesus. Listen, I, I love what I do. I like coming up here on stage on Sunday morning. I love preaching on Sunday. I like being crazy. But the greatest sermon you will ever preach is how you live your life. When you walk out of this door and you serve the world around you. My mom and dad got me a Walkman years ago. Those little fuzzy things they put on your speaker for the you know, headphone. Put that cassette in there. Hook it on your, hook it on your belt. And I get on my bike in Three Lakes Community in Donna Vista, Florida. This is no joke. When I was a kid, I used to put that Walkman on my hip, and I'd ride my bike all around Three Lakes in Donna Vista. And you know what I used to sing? You're about to find out. <laughs> and it's going to be good. Come back to the 11 o'clock service, and we'll share it with you at that time. Let's close in prayer. A song that has forever impacted my life. I'm giving you one verse. This is what it used to say. You ready? If you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. And then the second verse said the very same thing. And God impressed upon my heart. You want to be great in God's kingdom? Go stand by a hospital bed when somebody is struggling. Go stand at the door and greet people as they enter into a church. Go help out in the nursery and hold a baby so their mom and dad can come into a service. Go run a camera on a Sunday morning 
so that you can literally bring the gospel message into millions of homes in Central Florida. Do you think that lady that I, that I spoke to at Sanford the other day, does she know that camera operator's name? Does she know that person or that person? No, but I guarantee you one thing, she's grateful that somebody's willing to serve the Lord because they, they, they gave of themselves for a short moment so that they could help bring God's word into somebody's life. I'm gonna tell you something real quick. Listen to me, I'm getting fired up right now, so I better wrap it up. You wanna be great in God's kingdom? Serve, serve. I don't expect you to remember every sermon that I, that I preach. I'm humbled to even think that for two and a half years I sat under the preaching of a really, really, really good pastor. But I can't tell you all of the sermons, but what I can tell you is when people served, it'll change you. 